Good afternoon to all of you. It's terrific to be here with you in Chicago, and thank you for all you do to create wonderful residential living experiences for our seniors. As Bob said, my topic today is really about how healthcare is changing, moving outside of the walls back into your places and places like that. So let me start my tale today with a story. And let's go back in time. And let's think for a moment how healthcare was provided more than 100 years ago. This is from a painting about healthcare being provided in a rural setting back in the 19th century. And you can see a circuit rider minister here on a white horse with a doctor on the brown horse coming to visit a family on the frontier at their home. And you can see a woman weeping. Maybe somebody inside is very sick. Maybe somebody inside is near death. But this is how healthcare used to be delivered, going to people where they were. Now, today, let's fast forward to where we are. What do we do today? We go to where healthcare is. We go to physicians' offices, we go to hospitals, and very often we sit in the waiting room and wait <coughs> until the system is ready to see us. Well, this is, we know, is changing. We are now seeing more and more care delivered virtually via telehealth, as in this scene here. And when it comes to the aspects of healthcare that are about exchanges of information, not just the laying on of hands, more and more of that information is being exchanged virtually, as it is in almost every other aspect of our lives. What does this mean for you? You who are in the business of creating residential living for seniors. How will this trend affect your life? To Drill down on that, let me tell you another story. This is a story about two older women. I'll call them Lucy and Ethel. Lucy and Ethel are in their mid-80s. They're on balance fairly healthy. However, they have a couple of chronic illnesses, which as we know can be very typical with age. And among the things that they cope with is declining function of immune systems, right? So you're more susceptible to various infections, and things can come out of nowhere, even a common cold, and hit you pretty hard. So one winter, Lucy and Ethel, within days of each other, both come down with something serious, community-acquired pneumonia. They are very well one day, and a couple of years, days later, they're feeling under the weather, and soon they have full-blown high fevers. They're panicked caregivers, pick up the phone, call 911, and they get rushed to the hospital. Not on the same day, but within days of each other. There, Lucy, who goes first, gets assessed in the emergency department and worked up, as they say, and the caregivers, or the care providers there become extremely worried and decide that she needs to be hospitalized immediately. So she is, she's admitted into the hospital, She's given fluid, she's given oxygen, she's given intravenous antibiotics. Things seem to go fairly well and she does begin to respond. And then something goes wrong. She develops delirium. Delirium has multiple causes, but what we know about delirium now is that it really is an acute disorder of consciousness that can come on quite suddenly, caused by things like metabolic imbalance, dehydration, and also just the sheer shock to the system of being moved into, for example, a hospital setting. What we also know about delirium is that it is associated with greater morbidity and mortality. And in fact, many people who experience delirium suffer cognitive declines from which they never recover. Their cognitive baseline is lowered permanently. So delirium is bad, and in this case, for Poor Lucy, she ends up, as often is the case, spending longer in the hospital, so a several day stay turns into more than a week. Then she's discharged to a post-acute care facility, and it turns out that it is a couple more weeks before she's back at home. So a confined hospital stay that might have cost $25,000 ends up costing $100,000 as a total episode of care with a post-acute piece factored in. Now, 
that's the, in a way, the good news, because even worse things could have happened to Lucy in the hospital. She could have acquired MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus bacteria, which are, can be very uh, deadly for individuals and certainly are going to prolong a hospital stay. We know that 1.2 million Americans a year acquire MRSA in the hospital. And it adds to cost quite decisively, and of course it can result in much greater morbidity and mortality death. So it could have been that bad. It also could have been the case that she suffered a medical error. We know from a study done in 1998 that up to 100,000 people die in hospitals every year through avoidable errors. We know that falls, for example, are a huge source of additional mor uh, morbidity for people. They add to costs. A fall that results in an injury in the hospital will add $14,000 to the cost of a hospital stay. And of course, in some instances, it can begin the long road of decline to death. So it could have been worse for Lucy. Now let's talk about Ethel. Ethel has the same community-acquired pneumonia that develops quite suddenly. Her husband, shown here, gets panicked, picks up the phone, calls 911. She also is taken to the emergency department, and then something different happens. It is decided that Ethel can be hospitalized at home. Hospitalized at home. How does that work? The emergency room physician does a workup and says, you know, Lucy is sick, but she's not too sick. She doesn't need to be in the ICU or a coronary care unit. She, if, with given the kinds of care that we typically provide in a hospital, we can bring that type of care to the home, and we can give her that kind of uh, environment to recover in without all of the things that go wrong in the hospital, like avoidable errors, MRSA, et cetera. So that's precisely what happens. Ethel goes home. She goes along with a phalanx of equipment, uh, IV poles, IV solutions, uh, pulse oximeters. A doctor comes and visits every day. Nurses come in and call on her several times a day. Other medical assistants are visiting as well. And after several days, Ethel genuinely feels better. And she's able to be up and around and walking in her own home. And by the way, it is her own home, so she's not disoriented, and she doesn't fall victim to delirium. Which of these two people had a better experience, Lucy or Ethel? And which of these two people would any of us rather be? The answer is pretty clear. And what is also clear is that the kind of future of healthcare moving outside the walls outside of conventional institutional settings, more into people's homes and workplaces, is here. As the science fiction writer William Gibson says, the future has arrived, it's just unevenly distributed. But around the country, we can see many examples of these kinds of telehealth-related uh, exchanges in healthcare, remote monitoring, et cetera. It is here, and as more and more of these, this kind of information is generated remotely, it can be gathered into electronic medical sy record systems such as here, and actually we can provide the state-of-the-art care to individuals even at a distance. Imagine the people whom you serve and how they want to live their lives. Do they want to be as home as much as possible? Do they want to be in institutional settings? And recognizing that the future has arrived, how are you going to think about incorporating this into your experience? How are you going to think about meeting the desires of people like these who want the best health care, but they also want to be at home? I think you need to think about this as a question of competitive advantage as much as anything else. Because if you can speak to the seniors who understand what the future could offer them, it could uh, engender more business, if you will, for your, your facilities. What do you need to do to get ready? First of all, you have to be familiar with the technology that is coming about that is making all of this a reality. Whether it's telehealth, whether it's remote monitoring, 
or even more sophisticated things that are coming down the line. Second, you need to have relationships with the entities that are bringing this new world about, whether it is advanced health systems who understand hospital at home, and there are many of them, Mount Sinai in New York being a classic example, Johns Hopkins, places where hospital at home has been in place for years, primary care providers who are also more up to speed increasingly on these kinds of technologies. You need to know the suppliers, the people who are involved in logistics, uh, making sure that oxygen can be available and transmitted to home on a moment's notice along with other uh, supplies, and the other companies that are increasingly in this space, whether it is Call9, which has specialists in nursing facilities and other locations to actually connect patients with ED, emergency department clinicians, remotely when that is needed or Medically Home, a company that is working now on a lot of these logistical issues to create the infrastructure for hospital at home. And finally, with Medicare Advantage plans, one in three Medicare beneficiaries, as we know today, are in MA plans, and the projections are that there will be more than half the Medicare program enrolled uh, within a matter of years. And so some of the more advanced MA plan providers like Clover Health are working today with Medically Home to create these hospital at home capabilities. Let me close with three points. Healthcare is moving outside the walls and into the walls like you create for seniors. Seniors are going to want this and you need to be ready for them. And thirdly, when you do, they will thank you for it. Thank you very much.